Right. So, um, just like with any other treatment that you do for any kind of problem, we don't just kind of hop in and immediately start doing treatment. We have to have a good solid case simulation in place beforehand. And that means that our initial meeting with clients is usually an intake exam where I'm gathering information about problems of treating, uh, gathering information about comorbid problems, quality of life, uh, you know, what kind of differential diagnoses we're experiencing, and getting all that information to help inform us about how we're we actually going to go and treat what's happening. How are we going to formulate this case? And so this is pretty similar to what happens with any problem. Um, you know, depending on the presenting problems, you may or may not use specific kinds of measures, but a broad global assessment is always critical so that you don't miss things, so that you don't make assumptions about what's going on when, in fact, something else is actually causing the problem, not what they're coming in or being referred to. And this is all part, of course, of having a good, solid case formulation. So being able to really say, here's what's happening, here's how it's related to these other things that are occurring, and here's what we can then do. Thanks. And that can, of course, happen through things like clinical interviews, through simply structured interviews, through the giving of various kinds of self-parent or other report measures, uh, and just being able to determine, okay, what's going on with this? So, one of the most common uh, kind of gold standard symptom measures for OCD is called the Y-box, the Yale-Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale. The children's version is called the C-Y-box, children's Yale-Brown Obsessive and it's a semi-structured interview that covers about 75 different kinds of symptoms that someone is likely to experience when they have OCD. One of the reasons why doing something like this with OCD in particular is a good idea is because a lot of people will not realize what all problems they're experiencing that are OCD or that they're having things that are outside the norm. Because for a lot of folks that you'll be seeing, particularly folks who have had problems for an extended period of time, they don't realize that the way I'm acting or feeling thinking is outside the norm. A wonderful example is sort of folks with generalized anxiety who tend to, unless they come into therapy, just kind of think that everyone else around them is also worrying about everything at the time. And it's a very like stark realization when they realize like, really? Like you're not, you're not thinking about all the time and everything that could go wrong? No. What? What do you do with all your time? We see the same thing in OCD. So you look specifically. Quickly bring up uh, web browser. Sort of questions are on. Let's see my box. So um, 
I actually trained people, uh, including tomorrow, all over the country on how to do the live. Um, and it's, you know, a semi structured interview of just like uh, we'd have like with our intake to your clinic. Uh, but it's focused just on OCD. So after you define what we're talking about, give them an idea of what's going on, you then ask about different kinds of symptoms that they've had either in the past or experiencing currently. And you ask about them in these kinds of broad categories. So, for example, aggressive obsessions, sexual obsessions, and so on. Then you go down Asian, I'm sorry. Compulsions that you know are coming as a result of the obsessive thoughts. And you also, when you're going through it, You uh, actually rate their symptomology in terms of its impact. And so this gives you both a solid assessment of what all symptoms they're experiencing. And it gives you a baseline measure of how severe their symptomology is. It's pretty, pretty useful. Because then you can go back later and do that again and say, oh, it's therapy working. So this just gives you kind of an idea about this 14 page document. Right? So, this is pretty intensive. But oftentimes, people will not realize that certain kinds of compulsions are a compulsion. Parents won't realize it, the child won't realize it, a lot of times, adults. Don't. And so, if you only focus on the symptoms that they come in describing, then you may be likely to miss other symptoms. That they have that are as equal, if not more, than caring to. Make sense? So, again, a nice broad assessment uh, going through all these different kinds of symptoms is where we start. And then, once you've formulated your case appropriately, then you can start talking about all right, what do we do now? And that formulation may not take place all at the very beginning. You know, in the session, a lot of times it doesn't. Uh, a lot of times it takes you know one or two more sessions, which is completely normal and fine. But when you start doing treatment, this is kind of what I'm talking about in session four. When we actually start implementing our treatment process. So the very first thing you do, which is what all of us should do as good clinicians, is review the information that we've learned from them. Right, that includes talking about severity of symptoms, discussing you know, your formulation, and then starting to do a lot of what we did last week, which is providing education on what OCD is, what causes it, what maintains it, uh, what sort of behaviors are typical of OCD versus other problems someone may experience it, like ADHD or depression or something like that. So a large amount of education in that first session. And then, based on sharing the formulation, the education, we then roll into, hey, let's talk about what treatment looks like. And we describe, very much like I described for you all last time, here's an overview of the treatment program. In general, we're going to see for probably 10 to 16 sessions, Weekly at first, bi weekly, more towards the end. And here's what we're going to work on. We're going to give you specific tools as a parent. We're going to give your child specific tools. And we're going to be working a lot on two specific skills. One of those is called exposure with response to image, and the other is called cognitive restructure. Can you explain what those are for some minute? And kind of lay it all out and then let them ask questions because for the vast majority of the clients that you will see as an evidence-based practitioner if they've seen other therapists before there's a very good chance that you doing this kind of thing is going to be very new to you sharing a formulation laying out a treatment plan talking about how long it's going to take Talking about the research efficacy behind the century. 
can't even tell you how many parents I've worked with who, when I get, you know, about a year on this first session, are like, well, this sounds amazing because they've never had someone talk to me about it. They may have been treated with multiple providers who have never once told them, hey, here's what actually works to help this problem. Let's do that. Here's how we're going to do it. So, your session one, lots and lots of education, lots of information, and you're not doing a lot of intervention this first session. We're laying the ground for the intervention. And so, what we're then doing is we're then looping to, all right, I want to increase your awareness of what else and what's happening. And that means our first homework is actually just keeping a law of symptoms. Because there's a very good chance that you're aware of the things that are symptoms that they're not aware of as a result of your assessment. You're sharing that with them. You know how your child does this? Yeah, that's actually a compulsion. And they're having it because of this kind of obsession. What? Really? I thought they were just being a jerk. Or whatever word I'm just thinking is. Sometimes jerk would be better. And so we really just have them start keeping a record of some OCD symptoms. Now, we generally don't have them keep like every single symptom. We'll pick the top one, two, maybe three that are the most prevalent and most problematic. And we're doing that for a couple of reasons. One is to raise awareness right? and have them start becoming more kind of CBT like So we do that by having them say, okay, not only here's what happened, here's how long it's we spent with it, here's what happened with the family, and here was what I as a parent did as a result of this. Because when you are working with the families, there's basically zero chance that they are not in some way involved in the child's rituals. At the very least, they'll be accommodating them in some way so that they're reinforcing them. Quite inadvertently, they're not doing it on purpose, but they're doing it. And that's actually part of what you talk about when you're doing psychoeducation is Here's what accommodation looks like. Right? Here's what familial involvement looks like. I've seen families where literally the entire family is involved in the compulsions and the rituals, where everyone has a role to play there when it comes to these So we're making them think, what am I doing? Right, what's happening with the family? How much time is this taking? And we're really just focusing generally on one to three symptoms. The reason for that is because we take this a step. We're not going to try and treat everything all at once. But you can see here, you know, some examples. Here's what happened on Tuesday. You know, this this uh, this person, uh, this child. They have contamination in these two years. And they're worried in particular about food, but about some other things as well, being contaminated and being sick as a result. So here's what they did. They looked all over their food at dinner for mom. It took about five minutes. What happened? Well, it made us late because they wouldn't eat the food. Uh, what do we do? We have to answer a whole lot of questions. Are you sure this is no mold? Are you sure this is clean? Are you sure? How, when was this made? Right. How do you know that? How do you know it's safe? Where, where was it kept? How do you know there's not some mold on there, but I just can't see? And those sort of things, answering the questions, are of course just playing into person's OCD symptoms. They're providing insurance. They're reinforcing that these are questions that are okay to ask. All of which then 
unfortunately, just makes those symptoms more likely to pop up again. And this, again, this isn't a um, conscious thing that families are doing. Like they're not like, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to give my child free severus. Let's do that by constantly accommodating and reassuring. But I can tell you from uh, years and years of experience with these families, when you explain that this is what's happening to you, they will often feel a very heavy weight in response. We had one mom and dad, their, their kid was about five, so their kid wasn't involved in the education portion too young. You know, explaining all this to them, explaining how based on what you told me, here's what you do that is reinforcing or accommodating these symptoms. And they both just had these like crestfallen looks on their face, and the mom turns to the dad and went, We fucked him up. <laughs> I was like, Yeah, you know, I'm like, it's not only one. I'm glad you got that, right? But on the outside, it's like well, but here's the thing, you can also fix it, right? Like, yeah, you did that, but you did it because you didn't. You didn't understand the process that was happening. Because what's one of the most natural things in the world for parents to do with their children? Comfort them when they're distressed, right? That's what we do as parents, well, as well. Good parents. For example, I am all about exposing our children. Poor child. <laughs> oh, you're afraid? We'll do it three times then. <laughs> uh, which is not a joke, much to his sugar. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's very, very natural for us as parents. My child is distressed. What can I do to comfort them? Make them feel better. And for most families, when they have a child that's upset over something kind of ridiculous or silly, and they comfort them and explain to them why this isn't something to worry about, most kids are like, oh, okay. But when you have those biological and environmental predispositions towards CD, it doesn't. It actually just makes it worse. And so when you're working with parents, you're correcting parenting. Because the parenting that they use might have worked fine for this system. Might work fine for these people over here, but it's not working for this child. And that's kind of a good way to explain it is it's not that you're a bad parent. It's that what you're doing doesn't work for this particular kid. So here's how we have to shift. And parents tend to take that a lot. Yeah, you fucked up. Uh, but luckily, it came to me. Because it's not me fixing it, it's them fixing it as an entire family. So we keep track for this first week, um, keep track of these symptoms, start again having them kind of more uh, focused on that, more thinking about what's going on. Questions about that first session? Okay. This is not very different from what we'll be doing in most first sessions of most evidence based treatments. Pretty similar sort of protocol. Yes. What's wrong with that? This mask on upside down. I don't think it's not backwards. Yeah. My face. It's you. Yeah, my face. Stuck with it. Session two, they come in, they've been tracking symptoms for the last week, they were aware of them, thinking about them, they've been thinking about all the information that you told them. So the first thing we do, just like with any good session structure, is we want to check in with them and review the last week, the homework, and the last session. Particularly when you're throwing all this information out at them, you want to go back and you want to check their understanding. So, how did last week go? What symptoms did you notice? 
what sort of family involvement was there? What did you as the parents do? Was there disruption happened? How often was this occurring? Gives us a good baseline for starting to do number two, which is the development of our hierarchy. With kiddos, I'll often call this a fear ladder. Because what we're doing in developing a hierarchy is we're trying to figure out what are the symptoms someone's experience and where are they in relationship to the other symptoms. And we call it a ladder because in treatment, we start at the bottom and we start working. So those symptoms that are the most problematic will be at the highest point of the hierarchy. Those that are the least problematic or the least anxiety causing. And this development of the hierarchy is really something that you as the therapist are doing. And you're doing it based on your initial assessment and the data that they're bringing in over that first point. So you're not really doing an enormous amount of involvement with them right now in terms of your hierarchy. What you're going to be doing is, again, primarily with the parent in these first couple of sessions. And that includes giving an overview of the different tools that you're going to be learning. In particular, differential attention and how to reward appropriate behavior. Most of the parents who have kids who have OCD have been giving a lot of attention to the child. So they've been giving attention to appropriate. They've been responding to the wrong kinds of things, which is not unique to OCD in any way. We see this in propositional behavior, we see this other kinds of anxious behavior, we see this with depressive disorders, lots of stuff. So what we want to introduce is Hey, here's how we attend to the things that we want to see increase, and how we can ignore those things that we don't want to see. And this is often results in extinction bursts from the child. Good times. Because when someone's been reinforced for doing behavior for an extremely long period of time, what happens when you stop reinforcing? They do the pain more. Why? Because it's worked, so they're just like passive it's more worked. aggressive about it. Yeah, it's worked. It's worked for you know years, maybe. Well, I'll do it more. Right. It's like you all, if you're you know trying to uh, get the elevator to come back, uh, and you hit the button and it's not coming. I find it again. Then again, then again, it's not helping, right? It's not going to make it get there faster. The elevator's not like, oh shit, sorry. I didn't, I didn't hear. I didn't hear. I'm on my way. Maybe not. But it's the same sort of thing. You guys do it. We all do it. And folks with OCD. We prepare the parents for that. Because what we're going to be attending to are non OCD behaviors. Um, one of the most common things for kids to do is to ask parents questions as part of their compulsions and need very particular answers from those parents. When I say very particular, I mean often extremely specific and particular, down to a specific wording. If they don't get that, then they will become upset, right? Because their compulsion is not going down. If they do the compulsion right, my anxiety is not going to decrease. I'm going to try and do it again. I had one little girl I worked with, for example, who was 11. Yeah. And her major compulsion that was disturbing the family um, were these elaborate questioning rituals. They were only involving her mother. What it was, was she would have an obsession and intrusive thought that her mother didn't truly love her. We're talking about like, you know, an incredibly caring parent. It's not like, it could go either way. Like, I'm not sure. 
But it's like, no, obviously, this is incredibly But her compulsion wasn't just saying things like, yeah, oh, you really love me. Yes, of course, I love you. Kind of start that out. By the time we saw the woman, it evolved into this elaborate ritual where the mother essentially had to say that, yes, she would kill herself for the child. That's how much she loved her. That's a very condensed version because this was a 15 to 20 minute long compulsion that happened five to 10 times a day. Child, you love me? Yes, I love you. How much do you love me? I love you more than anyone else in the world. Okay, well, but how much do you give really, me? What would you do if you really, you know, it's just this escalating. Until finally, it was yes, I would kill myself if I needed to be sure that I would love. You. Okay, good for like 10 minutes right now. Oh, but now I don't know. It comes back again. So, we had to work with that law to differentiate attention. Here's what we're going to do we're going to not talk to this, we're not going to answer. Questions that OCD is asking. We can ask whatever questions your child is asking, of course, but we're not going to answer questions OCD is asking. And here's what's going to happen. They're like, here's what's going to happen. Here's what you're going to see with each other. Depending on the level of symptoms and the level of aggressiveness that will happen with certain children, you may or may not be able to start that. You know, for all symptoms at once, you may just pick one or two smaller things to start with, which is totally fine because you're practicing a skill. This is a new skill that parents are practicing. You also want to talk about reward. The vast majority of kiddos who come into therapy are not there of their own free will and volition. They're not even sure that they have a problem. This is especially true in OCD, where most children report that the problem is that their parents won't just do what they need to. Or the rest of the world won't just act like it's supposed to. If they would just do what they needed to. And so in order to have the children being engaged, the adolescents being engaged in treatment, we often need to have an extrinsic motivation. And, and then once change starts taking place and they start feeling better, then they'll start having more intrinsic reinforcement occurring and reporting. But that doesn't happen to parents. So talking with the parents about setting things like token economy systems up, how that works, what sort of rewards they're going to be getting for doing their OCD homework each day, that sort of thing. Which is again very common amongst different kinds of problems. That we talk about. There's a reason I decided to talk about OCD first and stretch it out into two workshops. Because a lot of this is very common to what we see across the country. So, talking about differential tension, we talk about reward and enforcement. And then their homework is to continue to track those same two symptoms. And then the parent's job. Is we're also preparing the rewards, we're preparing how to track those, what sort of charting do we use, so that we can then start that next time. Questions so far? It's like the token economies, is that age specific? Like you wouldn't do that with like a 15 year old at all, would you? Uh, you can, it works. You just have to set it up differently than yeah. a six year old. Yeah. 15 year olds not getting stickers and be like, oh shit, that's an dinosaur. Most things, right? Most yeah. So, yeah, just like with anything else, these are all highly developing systems. Um, the reward plans for an adolescent is going to look you know, quite a bit different than those for a five year old. But that doesn't mean you wouldn't be doing the reward. 
unless they just have enormous amounts of intrinsic information, then they're potentially okay. But here's the thing about anxiety and fear based problems they're very, very reinforcing. It's extraordinarily reinforcing for me to engage in those behaviors, even if I really rather not. So we need some sort of counter reinforcement up front, especially. Because doing exposures is not fun and pleasant. Those of you who took my OCD class are already aware of that, my anxiety I mean, you do that. And those of you who took the advanced counseling last semester, and we'll see what we do. So this is what your kind of initial development of your hierarchy is going to look like. We're just trying to put all the different kinds of symptoms down, obsessions and compulsions, um, thinking about, you know, where is it in terms of either causing the most problems or being the most uh, objectively distressing to someone. But it's a very kind of loose formulation at this time. This is me as a therapist, starting to try and rank order these a little bit, trying to figure it out a little bit. Um, but that's not my main focus for this session. Now. We come in the next week. As usual, we review last session, what we talked about, on, and then we introduce the child to the reward program. We're going to be doing OCD projects, or we're going to be, you know, working on your OCD symptoms, fighting OCD, whatever the particular language you. And you review the symptoms with the child. And these are the sort of things that we're going to be working on trying to help them. Trying to decrease this. Make it so that you don't have to do this as much. Make it so that you don't feel worried when you have these thoughts. And then we talk about these symptoms and we introduce the first of our child tools which is symptom tracking and feeling factors. Generally speaking, we call these SUDs. And SUD stands for subjective units of distress. Because what we're trying to teach the child is how to differentiate between levels of emotion, in this case, distress, anxiety, fear. Lots and lots of kids, especially younger kids, don't differentiate those emotions. In terms of levels, it's I'm afraid or I'm afraid. It's not how afraid. But we need them to be able to do that in order to know that our exposures are working and that things are happening. So there's a lot of different ways that you can track SUDS levels. Um, some of you are probably quite familiar with like the feeling faces up there. It's sort of a pain rating scale that we often use. Uh, we use it for adults too, mostly. But you can use it for anxiety. Like, how scared am I? How angry? How worried am I? Like the face. Or we can use literal thermometers where Where am I feeling? How much between enraged versus aggravated versus down here being fine? Am I? There's again lots of different ways you can do this. You can do this just with numbers for older kids and adolescents a lot of times. You can use zero to 10 scale. 10 is the most anxious and the most upset I've ever been in my life. Zero is I'm completely with that. Where are you feeling right now? For older kids, a lot of times you may bump it up to zero to 100. We teach them in whichever developmental level they're at. Here's how we're going to track emotions.
And then we talk with the parents about how do we do effective praise and encouragement. And this may seem like, well, don't people know how to praise and encourage? No, often, often they do not have any idea. Not at all. So let's talk about how you do that. Now you praise them for things that they have done, not for things they didn't do. Because that's not really crazy behavior to make it angry. How do we encourage? How do we get on that level with them so that they know we're on your team? We're on your side. You're excited. And then, now that I've got a couple more weeks worth of data on the family accommodation involved, let's talk about that. Here are the different things that you tell me you're doing that are helping to maintain your child's OCD. Here's what those look like. Here's what you're doing. Here's how that's happening. And I've seen families where there was a very minimal level of accommodation and most of the rituals were, um, you know, more private. So the child was in the room, in the bathroom, wherever. And I've seen rituals where there was nothing private. <laughs> Everybody was involved in the entire family with these rituals and didn't really know. They really didn't understand. So we do that and then we start our homework for monitoring symptoms. But now we're having the child monitor their symptoms as well, not just the parent. And that's the first thing that we're going to reward them for is reward charts, doing their homework of monitoring their symptoms. And getting them to start now being more aware and cognizant of here's what's happening with my OCD. This is a big change because this is the first thing we're asking the child to do. That's why we had to take all this time to set up with the parents, differential attention, accommodation, and set up the rewards. Don't just hop in and start exposures. And then you, as a therapist, are doing some between session work too, which is you're now revising the hierarchy. And you're making sure that that's really a good tool for us to start using this in the next session. So, questions so far? We're going to talk about the hierarchy. Well, questions so far? So, if we're treating fear and anxiety, well, from an evidence-based standpoint, we're using different kinds of exposure-based tests. And that's just what we're doing. Um, there's some controversy over exactly why exposure-based tasks help so many people with these kinds of problems. There's not controversy that they do. The most likely things that we're now learning is that this is really happening to what we call inhibitory learning and habituation. Um, habituation is a phrase that I think you're familiar with, right? Which is the more I have a stimuli, the less I respond to. Um, now that doesn't mean that happens all the time, right? Sensitization as well, but habituation is the more that I expose you to something, the less you respond. Inhibitory learning of learning is all about changing your expectations to what you thought was going to happen if you did something. So I think that if I touch that doorknob and then I don't immediately clean my hands, then I'm going to get sick. Inhibitory learning would okay. Well, let's touch that doorknob and see what happens. Let's see if that's actually true. Or, or if I don't say this prayer, 
immediately after having this intrusive blasphemous thought, then I'm going to die in prayer. Or something bad's gonna happen. Or whatever it happens. And so inhibitory learning really focuses on you getting new, incongruent learning experiences with what you think. Now, the cool thing about exposure tasks is you don't need a lot of the preparation for them to be effective and long lasting. Our very first well researched exposure therapies were what's called systematic sensitization. And in that, which was developed by Joseph Bolt back in the 50s, we spent a lot of time learning how to relax, preparing for the exposures. And then you would be exposed to something and relax. Turns out we don't need to relax. And in fact, it probably doesn't help. But instead, what we do is we expose people to the fear and stimuli, and then we prevent their normal anxious based response. That's why it's called exposure and response. With Katya is afraid of frogs, for example. Saw a frog. Ah, I would escape, I'd run away, I'd do something to decrease my anxiety. So, in exposure to suspension, we would expose you to a frog in a careful hierarchy based exposure for that and then not let you escape. Because it turns out when you do that, you can't stay in anxious forever. You'll see in the minute your anxiety goes up, yes, but then it peaks and then it goes down. As you learn, I don't have to hear this. What I really thought was going to happen is an action. Except now, a lot of people, therapy wise, are very afraid of exposures in terms of therapists. Like the, the clientele are very obviously afraid. But a lot of therapists are afraid about doing it. They think that they're dangerous or harmful in some way, um, which can be true if you do them for them. You can make the fear more problem. But when you do them well, they're incredibly safe, they're very well tolerated, and they cost huge amounts of cost. Let's take a break. The rest of my voice for a second. And then we're going to talk about how do we construct a hierarchy. Okay. Let's take a break. See you here. I was helping. I was a so living nanny. Like so. <laughs> a living nanny. A living. So. A, li a living. Okay. Yeah. So parents travel a lot. So we're doing good exposure. Start with the good height, and we do that by generating these very specific feared situations. Then we rate them using subjective units of stress. We just talked about faces, tin scale, red, yellow, green. Totally depends on the development of the child. Then we start by working at the lower exposures and going our way. Now, generally, we'll start at around like a 30%. We don't start all the way at the bottom. We start you know, about a third of the way up the exposure. And the reason for doing that is to give someone a task that they can accomplish, but that still will generate enough anxiety that they can feel that. And they can feel it change and drop. So going from a five out of 100 to a zero out of 100, not that significant. Going from a 30 to a five, much more salient, helps a lot with that hit. Um, so in terms of simply what we do, we want to make sure that our hierarchies are extremely specific. So it wouldn't just be something like writing. 
for using a public restroom. It will be a very specific list of situations within that area. So driving may be one of the fears that you see people have. I've treated a number of adolescents driving based obsessions and compulsions and fears. If we just say, oh, we're going to do a driving exposure, what does that mean? I don't know. That could be any one of millions of things. So instead, what we have to do is we have to have very highly specific things. It's not just driving, it's driving where? Driving when? Driving how? Not just using a public restroom, it's using what kind of restroom? Doing what in there? Touching what in there? Because the more specific that we're able to make this, one, the easier it is to plan and engage in experience. And then two, the better you're able to control the situation. So if I know, for example, maybe with something like this as a hierarchy, we would start like you know, down here at the 25, 35. Below that, I'm not too interested because who cares? Like, you're not very anxious, you'll probably be okay. Okay, so we're not just gonna go driving, we're gonna go driving in a parking lot during business hours. We're gonna see what happens. We're not just gonna go into a public restroom, we're going to go into a public restroom and touch the wall. Maybe that's an absurdity. Touching the stall door is higher. Touching the wall behind the toilet is higher. Touching the toilet, putting your face in the toilet and making blurbering sounds. Maybe your <laughs> vibes. <laughs> right. Good bubbly champagne time. No. These are the sort of things you have to get used to thinking about doing as an exposing there. You want to be able to. Did you have a kid roll around with me? I, I did, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I did have a kid roll around with me. Uh, <laughs> those of you who are currently looking at me like, it wasn't mine. Uh, <laughs> I got it from the police. They <laughs> I would love to have been there for that. Person. <laughs> this is a child who was 10 years old. He was very, very afraid of becoming a drug addict. And this had gotten to the point where their entire house and school and father and sister had all been contaminated by drugs. So they couldn't touch any of those things. This child hadn't been in school for about six weeks when they saw the touched anything that was contaminated with drugs, he would strip off his clothes, run into the bathroom, turn the water on and stay there. He would literally turn the water off in the house. Uh, very, very high disturbing. So yes, after going through these levels, we ended up with our kind of ultimate exposure, which was him in a bathing suit, uh, laying on the ground. Uh, Shaking a bag of weed over him when he rolled back and forth and saying, I love drugs, I love drugs. <laughs> uh, which, How does the conversation go with the police? Hey, I'm going to need a bag of weed. Awkwardly at first, especially because this was uh, the year 2006. For a 10 year ago. Uh, in Florida. Yeah. This is Dr. Lack. I'd like to talk to you, honestly. <laughs> He brings us to working like actual weed. Whenever he didn't know what drugs were, like <laughs> so, so which is a good question, right? Because like I could have used oregano or something. Okay. Um, but by the time that we had finished all the other steps, we'd actually done an enormous amount of education. Because when he started, he didn't know what even different kinds of drugs were. How you were addicted to them or anything. So it started, this whole thing started when he was on a bus. He was very anxious with this. He was on a bus, he had his favorite basketball with him going to school, two older kids behind him talking about how they had done drugs that 
we're talking like 12 cases, right? So we're like, they were not just like they were maybe sorting cases. And he became convinced that drugs had gone on off his basketball and his basketball touch, which ended up in his clothes, the school, the bus, all contaminated with drugs. And his, his actual thought process was that if he touched that, what was going to happen was he was going to addicted to drugs. He was then going to drop out of school. His parents would hate him. They would kick him out of the house. He would become homeless. And he would die then homeless and alone under a bridge. That's right. And we, we one of the first things, well, what kind of drugs? Drug drugs. <laughs> they literally didn't even know the name of a single drug. Right? Like, not even, like, non-description. Tons. Yeah, like, yeah, like aspirin? No, no idea. Right. So as a part of that, we did a lot of education about how you actually get addicted to drugs. And so part of that reason, the ultimate exposure we are using actual drugs is to help reinforce that you can't just get addicted to drugs by touching or touching something that has touched. Because that was his core. So that was our way to do the ultimate inhibitory learning device. We actually touched a shitload of drugs <laughs> and you're fine. Yeah, 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 I can't even imagine like which person's like, you wouldn't believe what these crazy ass therapists made me do. <laughs> it's like his deepest, darkest secret. And he's like, touch drugs. <laughs> The more specific your exposure hierarchy is, the better it is. Right? The better it is. And that's what I want you guys to do right now. Is to actually work on creating your own exposure hierarchy. What does that look like? Uh, and I want you to pick one specific fear that you have. And spend about 10 minutes working. Constructing that. I'm not actually going to make you all. This is an example of the kind of thing that you would do in a workshop that's an active, hands on demonstration. How many levels are there? However many you need. Yeah, however many you need. Uh, generally, I like to try and break things down where we've got it from you know, the very bottom to the very top. Right? So we've got at least a baseline and a seat, or a seat uh, for this situation. And then feeling in between that. Because you don't want, you don't want it to be necessarily like 25, 25 and a half, 25 and three quarters. Right? Like you don't want that. You're probably not going to have a good change between 25 and three quarters or 25. But if I go up you know, 25, 35, 45, and you know, five or something like that, that's much more. I usually won't break it down. In between or lower the bottom. But this is a sort of activity that you all could do, right? Like you could do something like this where you make your own hierarchies, talk about all, deconstruct a little bit, all of your fears is. And then, you know, I'm like, surprise! And I bring all the things that you fear actually in. You um, know, live stream it. Um, so, so that's an example of sort of thing that you can do. Another thing that you can do would be like pass around the measures that you use for assessment. So you can see those. Um, particularly because a lot of treatment guides and manuals will have those. So definitely useful to pass those things around or pass around copies of handouts. I've got kind of a few of those. Certainly do that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I know, it was a little hand, hand twitch. So when we're doing, um, you know, OCD specifically in terms of exposures, we tend to think about, okay, look, what's the obsession and what's the condition? For phobias, almost exclusively what you just see is avoidance and escape. Afraid of this, I do. Afraid of this, I don't ever get here in the first place. 
the real OCD, it's a little bit different. Because it's not just I'm afraid, it's oh, here's the trigger around me that then causes a particular obsessive thought, which then causes me to engage in specific compulsion. So when we're trying to kind of construct our hierarchy, we need to think about that entire sequence. What is the compulsion and obsession combo that we're talking about? That makes sense. And then we can start breaking. really breaking those things. So your fourth session, you're working on your hierarchy. Parents and now the child have been tracking symptoms. They've been introduced to wards, educated on what's going on with treatment. Everybody's feeling pretty fine. And then we bring in session four. Which is where we really start making. Like always, you review the last session, your exposure, what's going on, how's the reward program working, you can tweak that at all. It worked well, great, let's keep that. And then you go over your hierarchy that you've developed between sessions with them in session. Any changes, corrections, any additions, new things they've noticed, etc. Then you introduce the child to here's how we beat OC. Here's how we fight OC. And I'll usually use very, very strong language. Right? It's not like we're going to treat your OC. They know we're going to beat your OC. We're going to fight it. We're going to. This is the start of externalizing your OCD. Because for most of the kids, when they come in, it's just, I do this, I do that. And it's really hard to fight against yourself. Much easier to fight. Depending on, again, the developmental age of the kid, you can use different things. Like a lot of my littler guys and gals that I work with, we have them become heroes of various kinds. Um, my little girl, six year old, I've been working with. Um, she is all about that Milan book. Diagnosis. It's in there. Oh, Moana. <laughs> okay, good, good. Yes, I know. Yeah. So she becomes Milan to fight her I had one little guy who he was very big into Batman. So when we did exposures, he would literally go get his Batman cape to wear. He's like, this was awesome. Right? And I was like, shit. Yeah, <laughs> you, you got spare. So a lot of times I'll have them be heroes and they're fighting those speed that's good. And that's a really good, easy for them to grasp thing. What do heroes do? Heroes don't give up. They do the villains win sometimes in these stories. Sometimes it seems like they're going to. Then what do the heroes do? They fight hard. They get other people to help. This little boy, he enlisted his mom and his dad as other members of the Justice League. <laughs> right? They were helping him battle of evil OCD. I'll start talking about, okay, well, now how are we going to do it? If we want to be, if we want to fight, how? That's where you introduce exposures and cognitive restructuring. Now, cognitive restructuring in particular varies massively. And our whole goal there is to help them challenge these thoughts, these obsessions. Now that alone is not really going to make a huge difference, but it allows us to then do the exposures. It allows us to actually do the work that does make the most of it. So if it is an adolescent, do you, obviously you're not going to do the superhero with them. Do you just make yeah. it? Well, you might. <laughs> but. So do you just make it more plain, like 
you know, we're just going to argue with OCD and just externalize it. Yeah. Uh, so we still externalized it in the same fashion. Um, a lot of times I'll ask them what they want to call it. OCD. Most of the adolescents. The little kids will be very good. Yeah, or as like, but okay, why not? We'll go with that. Um, sometimes, like, if they were being a particular hero, they'll want to call it Agnes, the movie or the series. A lot of times, they'll just call it Rosie, but you're still using that same. Adolescence that's same externalization. We use it with adults too. Because again, a lot easier to fight someone else than it is yourself. So, in terms of introducing the argument, I will introduce this again very developmentally, but we'll talk about it from the perspective of. Okay. This is not the first question I'll ask. Have you ever argued with anyone before? Knowing damn well that they have, right? And this person they've argued with is probably sitting right next to them. Like, yeah. Like, do you think, do you think your mom or dad, whoever it is, do you think they've ever heard you argue before? Uh, okay, well, we're going to argue. We're going to actually practice arguing. But we're going to argue with this is it. We're not going to argue with me, we're not going to argue with dad or mom or grandma, we're going to argue with those two. I know you're good at arguing. We need to practice arguing with this particular person. So we'll do a little practice. So who in here, um, who in here has, has a fear or a phobia that they want to practice like Like to other people, not to you, obviously. Come on. I have a frog. frogs. Frogs? Really? <laughs> They're not. <laughs> okay, Marcy, let's go. <laughs> We're going to argue with your frog. Okay. Here's what's going to happen I'm going to be frog. You're going to be Marcy. You're going to argue with me. Right? You're going to try and prove me wrong. Oh my god, frogs are disgusting. Yes, they are. Expect to see my clients go, shit, right. <laughs> you got me on that one. You win. And so usually what I'll do, because they'll oftentimes have this stare like, I don't even know. How to I'll say, okay, Marcy, you be frog phobia. I'm going to be Marcy. Okay. 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 And I'm gonna argue. So what am I doing? I'm modeling first. Right? Like instead of having them just magically come up with it, I showed them it's tough. Now I'm gonna show them your school. Right. So your front foot. Tell me what your front foot means. Slimy little icky creatures. <laughs> it gets worse. <laughs> Have you ever held one? No. They don't slime me. They look slimy. <laughs> they look slimy. Well, everything is always exactly how it is. No, it's not. Well, but I mean, they are, sure. They appear to be. <laughs> oh, well, so you feel like they're slimy. And yeah. have your feelings ever been wrong before? Sometimes. Sometimes, okay. Which is great. That's way better than some, some people have ever just like, I don't know. Never. <laughs> okay, so your feelings have been wrong. So, do you do you know anybody else who's afraid of frogs? No, not a hand. But they're so slimy, they keep probably everybody's afraid. No, not everyone, because I see little kids pick them up and care. <laughs> and all those children stab them die, right? No, they don't. <laughs> you sure enough? Or probably like at least like a significant percentage, like 75, 80 percent. I'm pretty sure none of them die. I'm pretty sure none of them die. <laughs> Not from the frogs. Um, 
One of the other things I do a lot of, which is what you guys are seeing right now, is humor. The reason I use a lot of that is because it helps me to be able to work. Marcy can't be terribly afraid and genuinely laughing at the same time. So all those kids that died from the, the frog fishing up. Um, you know, that's why that's why I think the frogs are eating. They should be, but they're not. They should be. You should ban them all. I should serve no purpose. I agree. <laughs> uh, okay, let's switch up. You start you start arguing with me. We should ban all frogs. Like we should kill them all. Well, probably not kill them because I don't like to see animals killed. But if we could just ban them to a certain area, <laughs> I'd never see them. They're dangerous, folks. Well, they're not dangerous. I mean, thousands of people die every year because of frog attacks. No, no one's dying from a frog. They've got the sharp <laughs> pointy teeth. <laughs> they have teeth. They have that tongue. Sure, they don't have teeth. I don't get close enough to see, but, but they're dangerous. No, they're not dangerous. Yeah, they're, they're pretty dangerous, Marcy. No. They're dangerous and they're disgusting. They are disgusting. Dangerous, probably not. Now we get to the root of what Marcy's actual thing is. It's, it's a disgust yeah. issue, not a not a fear issue. Yeah. You're not afraid the frog's gonna like kill you in your sleep. No, 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 no. Right, like murder curtain, <laughs> like coming in there, right? Um, but you're disgusted, Marcy. Yes. Okay. Hmm. Well, so why do you think those little kids are okay with the picture? They're not disgusted by anything. <laughs> okay. So they're not actually dangerous. They're not everybody finds it. No. What do you think the worst thing that would happen to you is if I like pulled a frog out of my pocket and like came over close? I just won't want to hold it that I guess I could like yeah. <laughs> okay, so you can look at like nothing bad's going No. Uh, has anyone in here ever held a frog before? <laughs> what about toads? Toads? <laughs> Toad holding? Has anyone here ever raced frogs before? Okay. <laughs> yeah, little towns. Bears. Yeah, I've got a picture of me. Yeah. Mountain View News, 1982. Bears on Gold Dog hunting. Yeah. Oh, okay, that, those are huge. Those are pretty huge. Yeah. <laughs> but my fear with that is not necessarily the frog I'll hold the frog. My fear is I'm going to stick my hand down there and it's not going to be a frog. That's my fear. Oh, well, that could be reasonable. <laughs> so, so fear and disgust often overlap. But a lot of people are more able to easily rationalize the way, okay, I shouldn't actually be afraid. Compared to the disgust, which is a, a, a really, they're both very primitive reaction. The disgust is almost more visceral, more detrimental. But we would do it in the same way. So I would have Marcy look at the picture, maybe one or two, which would be fine. Yeah, that's fine. No, that's not disgusting. I say, okay, well, why is looking at this picture, okay, looking at a real picture of a frog? Right. It's real. Because it's real. I might even have her touch that real picture. Which is not actually going to explain it. It's not going to explain it. <laughs> uh, which I probably will. But when we start getting closer and closer, moving up that hierarchy, you're going to have those responses. Right? <laughs> So I would do everything first. I hold the frog first, right? Touch the frog. The problem with frogs is they jump a lot. So we probably have to take the container for the, the frog. Mm -hmm. box. Right? So the hand in there. I'd have you put your hand on the outside, which is something you're going to be kind of grossed out. 
first. What if he like comes in? What if he like breaks out? <laughs> Then I'll have you just put your hand in a little bit. Or like, you could jump up. My ultimate goal would be to have you touch the car. For a couple of reasons. One, to help with that inhibitory learning. And show you that, like, frogs aren't really slow. Like, they're not like snails. Are like, frogs are slick. But they're not sly. They're not using <laughs> slush. Um, and you're gonna be like, oh, that's not bad. That didn't feel like I thought of it, which is changing that schema that you have about what this world is. Do you see me touching wrong? Like if that's happening to me, I'm not being forced. Or spiders or snakes, whatever it is that we have to do. Here is the kites touching the toilet bowls in the public. Toilets, eating the toilet cracker. Where you put your hand in the toilet, swish it around a little bit, you know, shake, pick up the cracker, and eat that. Eat that cracker, and you say, Do I die? Have I died? Not yet. <laughs> Teen, 16 years now, a single death recorded. Frogs are actually surprisingly common here. Um, amphibians, generally insects, reptiles, broadly speaking, uh, spiders. So if you're going to be a good exposure therapist, you have to be okay with interacting with such creatures. Which is why, if you all look underneath your seats, right? <laughs> A mystery creature taped under there. It's like over, right? <laughs> What's it gonna be? Who knows? Didn't you have a colleague in Florida that was like scared of insects? I did. So, so I had one of the other folks that was working on our OCD treatment program, my dear friend, uh, who was fine doing all of like the gross stuff, right? She's like, oh, that's not a problem. She couldn't handle insects. Uh, she'd be like, I'm gonna, I'll trade you for that exposure. <laughs> <laughs> we did that for a little while, but then our supervisor would be like, nope. So we actually, we canceled all our patients one day. They came in ready to do therapy. We're like, oh, we're doing therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> no, the yeah, so she wasn't a fan of it, but then she was able to do it. If you have to like specify which ones you try to choose usually, Yeah, it's usually not um, it's usually not that all insects are equal. Right? Just like not all frogs would be equal. Um, so like a frog in like a swampy environment would probably be much worse than a frog just in it. Um, a giant frog. Would probably be worse than the world, right? Because yeah. there's more surface to be slimy. Um, so, the same sort of thing. Not all insects are as equal as that. Cockroaches might be the worst, which is ridiculous because it's not like they're bad. Usually, it's a disgusting issue. Um, but it might be like yeah. spiders are way worse than cockroaches. Yeah, yeah. Everyone else. Yes. <laughs> but even then, not all spiders are equal. So if I took, for example, the largest spider I've handled personally, it's called a bird in the tarantula. It's a South American spider. It's, the body was about as big as both of hands. Uh, that would probably be worse than like Danny Long. Right? Which is not even actually just so you all know. Um, and then there's we between being in the same room with that spider versus touching the spider, touching the container as well, which is where we go back to that hierarchy being so crucial, right? And developing that hierarchy in this very stepwise fashion. 
because that also lets them know here's what's next. And it reminds them here's what I want. So we introduce the argument. We get them to start arguing a little bit. And then we do our first in session exposure. Which is where the real I love, I love doing this with you. It is fantastic. It is by far my most favorite thing. The reason for that is not because I'm a statistic ass. <laughs> <laughs> It's because you can see improvement within session. I mean, within a session, you see change happening from minute one to minute ten in this session. It's incredibly rewarding and reinforcing as a therapist and as patients. When we're doing these exposures. You can do different kinds, right? And for different types of problems, like you'll see throughout the semester, you might do more imaginal based exposure tasks, which are where you're not actually doing something, but thinking about it. So you use a lot of PTSD, for example. Or you do more in vivo exposure tasks, which are more in the live in person. So I might, Marcy, have you, I'm thinking like, I'm sorry, volunteer. I might have you like close your eyes and imagine a frog. And imagine seeing yourself touch. And if you have a truly high enough suds level, that's going to make you feel uncomfortable. Right? Like me, like I'm not. I have frogs get in my house all the time in the spring. So. Uh, and it's always like, quick, quick, capture them and save them. And like little tree frogs. Yeah, they're indoor, right? <laughs> And then you get like those fat tuckets. They're just like, I'm here. <laughs> and like, oh, no. And the little tree fox is like, Jesus. <laughs> right in the snapper. The wide variety of exposure at my house. We're all, <laughs> I'll invite you. <laughs> but we might do an imaginal first to get you kind of practicing those skills to be in the or for things where maybe they're very abstract. Like I can't really do this. Like, you can't make your parent not love you. <laughs> right? But let's imagine what it would be like if you did that. And so we can do some of those, imagine closures first, but our goal is always to do these. And always to do these. And in OCD in particular, what we're usually exposing you to is not necessarily the feared outcome, it's we're exposing you to the trigger. And that's why you saw that earlier when we talked about the trigger and the obsession and compulsion. We're exposing you to the trigger to see if that obsessive thought is actually there. If I don't wash my hands right now, then I'm going to see. If I stepped on this crack, one of my family members is going to have a terrible crack. If I touch this basketball, I'm going to become a drug addict. I dropped out of school. Let's test it out. Let's see. Let's see what happens. We do these exposures both in session and out of session. I'll always do them in session first and model what we're doing. And then your homework is almost always now you go do it with your friends. It's the same thing we did right here. Now it's your turn. And so I'm always doing these first. I'll do the exposure myself. I'll touch the thing, I'll say the thing, whatever it is. And then I'll guide the child to watch so they can see this is how you do this, how you encourage this. Praise them, and help them with the arguing and restructuring. And this is how you maintain a chill calm down. But I'll always do it first myself. Because then subsequent times when they're doing it with their parents, they know they've already done it. They've already survived this. So it's gonna be easier for them. I'm just like, all right, mom, dad, go 
Try that. See how that goes. No, it's like I've already done it. Watch me do it. We know we can do, you know, survive. So let's do this again. And this is really where we're using that rewards program. Successful completion of exposures outside of session. Because I'm not bragging, but I'm really good. I think I can get people to do things that they've never done before and do so relatively. And I'm teaching the parents how to do that, but they're not there yet for the first few sessions. So you're going to need those external rewards and courses for almost all children and adolescents that you work with. And you remind them of that. Remember, you do this, you get this. And this is one of the other reasons why we start lower up the hierarchy. To make it very doable. I can start at the top. Of that. We can do that. It works. It's called flooding. <laughs> but it is very, very difficult to get people to agree to do it, especially children. And it's pretty rough. It works. I've done it before in situations where it was called for. But we generally start with this hierarchy piece. We're going to lay out. We use the subs to see like where somebody has right now. Because what we're optimally wanting is the subs decrease of at least 50%. So if you started at 30, I want you down to 15. So we want to do these over and over again. Prolonged, repeated exposures where you prevent distraction. Because people who have anxiety are very, very good at distracting themselves. And escaping situations and avoiding situations. So a kid might try to strike up a conversation. Or they might start humming. Or they might start crying. Or they might start trying to argue with their parents. All of which is designed to take their focus away from trigger the object that's causing them distress and the fact that they're not completing their compulsion. So this is why we start at the bottom of the line. We're building those skills. Just like if you're learning the piano, I don't start you out. With rock monitor. We'll start off with playing Mary Had a Little Lake. Or Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. So we start slow and build our way. And then by the time we get to these things that were once seen as there's no way in hell I can do this. It becomes, oh, this is just a little bit worse than the last time. So I think it's fun. So you get more and more. Does this apply to the hierarchy of symptoms as well, where you're, you're starting at the, the low end and building up the high, or maybe addressing the, the symptoms that cause the most distress within the household to produce the most change? Yeah. So generally, those symptoms that are causing the most distress are the same ones that are causing the most impairment in quality of life. Um, so generally, they're the exact same. If, if there's a difference, right? Like this symptom is causing a lot of impairment in the family, or problems in the family, but it's not very, you know, high on my, oh, this isn't very fearful for me list. Well, great, we'll do that first, but right? it's down there lower. Um, one of the things that we see with doing these exposures is that kids and adolescents and adults all start generalizing pre-COVID, which means the next one's gonna be easier, the next one's gonna be easier. So typically those symptoms that cause you the most impairment are the same ones that are higher up on your hierarchy. So if we try to just attack them first, you're much higher likelihood of failure. Right? So we'll start lower and work our way up. Then that be your goal to see what's a symptom that's high on the symptom. Yes. Yeah. 
because you can get in, and it's very common to see people who have um, multiple OCD areas of problem, contamination and religious obsessions. So when we construct a hierarchy where they have those, I'll basically construct a hierarchy for the contamination and then for the religious one, and then we'll change them together. So we might be doing contamination this week, religious ones next week, religious ones and then contamination. Is that kind of what you're asking for? So when we switch them together like that, then we just go in order as opposed to um, like, all right, let's get all of your contamination fears first, but then let's do it. How does it look if it's not a physical um, fear, but it's more like you said, my parents don't love me. So how do you do that? Yeah, so what we would do is, this is why we focus on the trigger. So what is the trigger that causes the obsession? So it might be this little girl we talked about earlier, it was um, if she saw her mom displaying affection towards anyone else, giving her sibling a hug, your father a kiss, that would trigger this obsessive thought of she messed up. So what we do is we expose you to those triggers. So there's always triggers. We don't expose you to the consequences that you fear are going to happen because they're unrealistic. Like, um, like I wouldn't, uh, you know, make you watch someone get murdered by frogs. Because <laughs> it's like that's not going to happen. Um, so what I would do is I would expose you to the thing that triggers the fear and the city feelings of disgust. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, we expose you to that. Let your obsession come out. Let your anxiety rise. And then we expose the vent compulsion. So uh, I bring the sibling and the mom in. It's sitting in there. The mom reaches over and gives the sibling. What does she do? She immediately wants to ask that compulsion. Mom, do you like to do mom? Do you now, what we can do, especially with kids, is we may not be able to have them like ask to do the We can have them not be accommodated. Like she's going to say that very automatically. Mom, you're not going to respond. So we're teaching the family not to reinforce it. And she's going to extinction burst. Mom, you love me. Mom, you love me. Mom, you love me. The mom is going to. Saying, you're not going to talk to OCD, but if you have a question, you're not forced to answer. Now I'll work with her on an argument. Like in a second. Then what will happen is this. So your anxiety will spike here when you're not allowed to do the, what normally you would do that allows you to increase your anxiety. Start the exposure at this point. You would typically do a compulsion, which means my anxiety is going to go. And I'll let you do the compulsion. This is response prevention. Your anxiety goes up. And people who have problems with fear and anxiety think that what's going to happen is my anxiety is going to continue to increase. And it's going to go up and up and up and up and up until my heart explodes and I die. Which, of course, isn't the reality. Reality is, yes, when we prevent the use of your typical escape, avoidance, compulsion, your anxiety will increase, but it can only get so high. And then it levels off because it can only stay so high for so long. And then it starts to. And then we wait until it decreases at least 50%. And then we'll do it again. We'll do another exposure. We'll start, I'll expose you to the trigger, right? Your anxiety goes up. You don't want to do a compulsion. We want you to do a response prevention. Your anxiety will not go as high the next time. It'll plateau quicker and it'll decrease quicker. And then we'll do that again. And then we'll do it again and again and again until what you see is you see flattening of this curve. 
I just told you the trigger. You might still have the obsessive thought, but your anxiety does not rise. It just becomes a little. It's just a little bit of anxiety, way easier to not do that. Make sense? It's big time. I really do. This is the same process that you use with phobias. The same sort of thing that we use with PTSD. Um, generalized anxiety is a little different because your trigger tends to be life. So you're constantly being exposed to it, so you work more on preventing rumination and things like that. Much more similar to what would be depression. A little bit different. But for the fear based problems, exposure is what we're interested in. So you assign exposure tasks, then they're very similar to what you do in session as your home. And you have them keep track of your report. All right, what did we do? How anxious were you beforehand? What about one minute, two minutes, three minutes, etc. Let's track that. This is great because this allows the kids to have a concrete memory. How scared are you? Because what do we do? Well, we as humans tend to interpret situations from our current stance, not our stance that we were. Like say, do you remember two weeks ago when you thought you couldn't do this? Well, I mean, that was simple. It was, it was fine. Really? Because I've got your sheet right here and you were at a 70 out of 100. So I think it really wasn't fine, but now you're doing it just like that's not a big deal, right? Yeah, I'm not worried about that. Anymore. Okay, well, what do you think is going to happen if we do this experiment? I think we're going to see the same thing. Uh, well, let's try. Let's just try it again. I think, based on what has happened, And that's their job as parents and kids is to do those tasks in session. Because the more that you do them, the quicker you recover. This is one of the reasons why we can do mass exposure sessions or like daily sessions. And we see amazing treatment progress very, very quickly. Intensive treatment works just as well as spaced out treatment because it's not necessarily how long it's been, it's how many exposures have been, how much inhibitory learning has changed by the experience. And you, as a therapist, doing exposure work, have very specific jobs. One is to be a good mom. Both for the child about how to approach your fearful situation and for the parents on how to help your child in these fearful situations. But you also have to be a good communicator of why this is happening and why it works. Short term pain, long term pain. Yes, you're going to feel unpleasant for a little bit. That means you're going to feel better over the long term. What you've been doing right now. You've been feeling better for the short piece of time that makes you worse. You're having short term gain and long term. We're going to flip that. And a lot of people will be able to get this. But you to make sure that you're communicating that to your family, you're working with them collaboratively, you do the CBT, or you work with the family, not on the family. And you're doing a whole lot of maintaining. What I tell my kids that I work with is that you and I are going to have a very predictable relationship. And it's going to look like this. So draw it off. Or not. Really? Can I not? There we go. 
<laughs> What's going on? Why is it not working? Piece of shit. COVID is still there. Oh, there's Marcus back there. Okay. Hang on, internet. Why are they at the back? No one's looking back. So what I tell them is that this is time, this is how much you like it. At first you don't know me. You don't know me, right? So it's not very it's not very high how much you like. It. But I'm pretty good. So you're gonna like me here. You're gonna be like, Dr. Caleb's okay. He's not too bad. Pretty good, pretty good. And then we do an exposure. <laughs> and you're going to hate it. <laughs> he is so terrible. I can't believe what that person is doing. Wait, what? <laughs> What's happening? Oh my God, this is awesome. I love that. And that's exactly what's going to happen. And the kids are always like, whatever. And they're doing, they're like, damn it, you're right. <laughs> what happens? Because once they start doing these exposure tasks and they start eating OCD, they start realizing, like, oh, you were trying to treat me you were trying to help me. You're not just making me a jerk and making me do these terrible things. Like, yes, did I kind of enjoy pouring a bunch of cockroaches from a jar on a young man in the bathtub? Like, was that kind of funny for me? Yes. <laughs> but did that really help that young man get over his fear of all incense? Also. Did that family really like me? Did the kiddo like me? Yes. And that's what happens with you all when you're effective therapists with family or with an individual. They trust you, they like you. And you have to maintain that rapport. And like, I don't just start doing exposures the first time I see something. Like, oh, my child is really afraid of snakes. Well, come here, kid. <laughs> this is mom tick. Or why don't you go look at what this in the box, kid? <laughs> What's in the box? What's in the box? We just work first. Work. You also want to make sure that you're not allowing distractor behaviors and avoidance. Again, these are really good about this. What's really good about this? All of your focus should be on helping them argue with their anxiety and then checking on what their sub levels are. Not having a pleasant conversation. I'm actually going to, I don't have time in here to watch all of it. Um, some of you have already seen it, but I'm going to put a session of me doing exposure therapy uh, in our CBT or OCD. You all can watch. A lot of it is very quiet. We're just sitting with the anxiety. And I'm monitoring and making sure that the person's not being distracted or avoiding things. So let's put that in there. I usually conduct one in here, but because of protocols, I'm not supposed to be that close to all of you while I'm making you feel extraordinarily. So you're going to watch me do this with somebody else. And then when we're able to be more mask free, you show up each one of your houses with your fears. Mm -hmm. So, okay. who knows when it's not going to, it's going to be surprised. <laughs> not, not, not going to be forewarned. Not your therapist, I'm your professor. <laughs> 
You also have to be flexible and creative because a lot of times things will not go as you expect and planned. Particularly when you're dealing with live creatures. Um, so I've been bitten by snakes before, exposures, insects bite me, children bite me, <laughs> uh, which were by far the most disgusting. Let's be honest. These little germ disease packets. Um, so yeah, you have to be creative. When something doesn't go as well as you thought it was going to be, that's okay. We'll just roll. Um, and this is also one of the reasons why you have to be okay with doing the exposures that you are going to be asking them to. Because if I'm doing, let's say, contamination based exposure, I'm trying to tell them, like, no, no, it's fine. You can touch the hole. <laughs> no, see, I'm just, oh, <laughs> just touch it, right? And I'm having to, like, do therapy for myself in the moment. What are they going to be doing? They're going to be like, oh, that's just my. <laughs> Say, if I'm like, look, toilet, it's fine. So My favorite ever contamination exposure was we were working with a little boy. This is a bathroom exposure. We were gradually increasing the amount of time before you could wash his hands after doing bathroom exposure. This is terrible. And so he had, like, he had done a toilet cracker exposure. Typically, he loved this. We did it, and then it was someone's birthday, like on the unit that we were on. So there was some cake setting out, and he was like, Is that cake? I was like, Sure, but I don't think we have any utensils. Um, Let me look around. And he was like, That's cool. And just like <laughs> grabbed a hunk of the cake with his toilet hands. <laughs> and just like, um, I just remember going like, my God, that's fantastic. And also, oh. <laughs> they started like licking the icing off of his toilet fingers. And I was just like, good job, buddy. I gotta go to the bathroom myself. <laughs> his mom was just over there, just like mouth the cake. Like, it's like, this cake's amazing. You know, it's just like, get some more if you want. Like, who knows, Bob? <laughs> but I've also had people completely flip out, right? I've had children who I literally had to put in safety holes because they were being so aggressive, because their anxiety was so high during the exposure. I had parents that I had to kick out of the room because their anxiety was so high. <laughs> During the exposure, and they started crying. Not helping a kid it also explains why you're all here in the first place. <laughs> so you have to be flexible, and you always have to keep in mind: like, what am I doing? It's the therapeutic purpose, of it. and what I do next is that going to serve the ther my therapeutic goal or not? I'm just like, buddy, no, don't lick your hand. Is that going to help? Nope. I'm like, no, sit there and sob openly, mom. <laughs> Go ahead. It's not going to help. Mom, I need you to leave. Who would I have right now? <laughs> oh, the child has jumped up and ran out and is now running across the camp. Well, let's just let him go. Run for us, run. <laughs> That's so, what she it's like, well, if we know they're a runner, <laughs> here's what we're going to do. We're going to make sure that I'm sitting closer to the door. So that when they try and make an escape for it, I can grab them. I make sure that the parents are sitting on the other side of the door, waiting for them to come out so the parents can tackle them. Because I can tackle them. But like, I blame them. So that's not going to so. I go hard. <laughs> Doesn't matter if it's 
And you also have to be flexible if you're like, I did not think you would expect this to happen. I was seeing uh, a young gentleman about 11, very severe. Uh, lots of contamination issues. His one will do with uh, his own self covered or cleaning related issues. So, like cleaning after you toileted, excessive showering, things like that. We were working on accommodating, on decreasing the amount of time that he was doing things because he would use like an entire room. Uh, so I got there for an appointment. The mom meets me and she goes, Well, we have a little problem. Uh, he, he won't close. Well, close. Well, that was unexpected. But I wasn't like, All right, well, I'll see you when he's dressed. I was like, Okay, well, you and I can work down here at the kitchen table because he's upstairs. We'll just see what happens. Because he was refusing to put clothes on because he didn't think he'd use enough toilet paper. So he wanted mom to accommodate him by bringing more toilet paper upstairs when she had given him his allotment of toilet paper. Like, that's okay, we can practice our skills. Ignoring attention. And so he had an extinction burst, but his extinction burst wasn't angry, it was, I'm naked. But I still really want that toilet paper. How am I going to accomplish this? But first, I see like a head, like <laughs> come around like the banister. Right? And I was like, He's up there. like I know I have eyes. <laughs> Mom, He's like you tell me you're not going to talk to me just because I see me. Very upset. He just sort of like starts going down the stairs, fuck ass naked, right? <laughs> like hiding behind the banister. <laughs> mom, mom, like she's not hearing. Like she is obviously hearing. I'm like, we ignore this. I'm like, are you sure? I was like, well, I am. And I appreciate it. Or otherwise, this whole session is going to be for naught. Let's ignore it. Okay. So he got about halfway down the banister <laughs> until he finally realized we were not going to go. Then he went upstairs, put on some damn clothes, and came back down. It was like, oh, hey! So glad you could be here. Thanks for coming in. I didn't know what was keeping me. I knew what was keeping me. Right. So obviously, we just ignored all that behavior. And you know what he did the next time I showed up? He had clothes on. <laughs> he was ready for this work because he knew it wasn't going to work. I had worked with his mom in ignoring this ridiculous escalation of behavior for 45 minutes. She was like, well, I can do that. I'm sure I can handle the rest of these things. And she could. And he learned. He learned that he was not going to be able to get her to engage in this bullshit. But that was not what I was expecting. I left going like, this is, people pay me to make them ignore their naked children <laughs> yelling for toilet paper. What a bizarre world we live in. This was part of my five year plan. Yeah, uh, this was not on my list of things I was planning on doing with my PhD. But here we are. And that's okay. Uh, flexible, you're creative. A lot of people worried about making their clients feel upset because we're natural. Um, you know, people go into the mental health field because they want to make people feel better. I would naturally like to relieve your distress. You as a therapist have to realize I am relieving your distress. It's just I'm going to make you a little more distressed. You have to remind not only the family of that, but yourself. Because it's hard seeing people in distress. It really is. If it's uncomfortable, if you have any sort of art about you, which I don't think it's born to a death. 
Why? It's not dangerous. You're not going to give your client a heart attack. It's not going to die. I have done literally thousands and thousands upon thousands of exposures with my clients, and I have not had a single one die. I haven't done that. And that's included things like having them hold knives up to my neck because they have intrusive, aggressive thoughts about stabbing me. Still here, neck and all, but still attached. Just a small scar, and that's why I'm here. So, this can be emotionally draining, especially if you're doing trauma work. Um, you build up your psychological calluses over time. But you also have to realize that, particularly if you're doing trauma work. You can have some vicarious exposure to trauma yourself. And so if you taking care of yourself is very important when you're doing that kind of work, especially. You see less of that with like OCD. It's not like I'm walking around like, oh no, I'm now afraid of this completely ridiculous thing. Right? And I'm not worried about it. You do see that in trauma. So, like I said, I'm going to uh, put up a video for everybody to watch. Uh, see that. It's like, I can't remember, it's like 25 minutes, 50 minutes ago. Uh, but it's it's uh, a lady uh, who's not a child, but, you know, reported, but it's a lady with a snake foot. Um, and we're watching her treat her snake foot. We did have small time for It's pretty fun. Pretty cool. So you have watched it. Like, oh, so like that already. Um, but this would be an example of something you could do, like the workshops. So exposure therapy. Um, you know, going back to our session structure, I think we took a big detour. Let's go back. You're modeling how to do the exposure, right? Showing them here's what we do. And then you're making sure that the family remembers, here's what not to do. Here's how to use your differential attention skills. Here's how to, uh, you know, make sure that you're not contributing to making mistakes worse. Let's talk about what's going to make it difficult to do your homework, which is going to be exposures, and positive attention. Then you get out there and do that. Get out there, you're going to be doing exposures from now until the next session. And this is kind of what we do then for the rest of training. Check the homework, see how those exposures went, see if there was a decrease in response to those triggers. Then we move up the next step of the hierarchy. The next task, do it in session, and then do that outside of session. Practice the argument, practice modeling them, practice conducting the exposures. And then you have them do that. That's kind of what you do until, oh, look, now we're okay. That doesn't mean there won't be like bumps on the road. It's not infrequent that people who've been avoiding certain things rate them as much lower than they actually are in real life. It's like, oh, that's only a 50 out of 40. Because they don't know, because they've been avoiding it. And then we get to do the exposure, and it's like, oh, that's a 500 out. So there's things like that that happen, but that's why you always do exposures in session first. So that you can model how to do these things. And show the kids that, hey, now as you go on, you do certainly introduce. Kind of what we call scaffolding or coaching, which is helping the parents see symptoms as they're arising, and then coaching the kids through exposures like on the fly to those symptoms so that they don't become session compulsion. And the scaffolding part is part of that drive to help the child see that, support them in doing these exposures, but I'm not just pre-planning everything. 
So helping them, you know, help the parents understand, like, here's how I approach this task. Oh, what's going on? How are you feeling? Oh, gosh, that's not a feeling. I'm sorry. Okay, what should we do? And it sounds like that's OCD trying to make you feel bad. Control you. What do you think we should do? Okay, well, let's choose one of those, do it, see what happens, and then reward them with things like positive attention and praise for actually doing it. Again, that's just kind of what we do, right? We talk about how do we work these next exposures? We start talking about generalizing, we start getting people back into um, you know, kind of a regular routine at home, start addressing other comorbid problems that are happening as well. Um, checking in you know, every session to make sure that people are on task with what they're supposed to be doing, you kind know, of sort of drifting away from what they're supposed to be doing. That's really what we do, which is pretty fun. And then you, you know, start spacing your sessions out. You start talking about you know, how we're going to prevent any relapse. How are you use the skills that you learn in order to not, you know, have these things flare up again? And then what do we do if they do flare? And you come in again for you know a booster session, for example. Sure, of course. Um, you have resources at home to help remind you of what you're supposed to do. Have you read your books or do you have your videos bookmarked that help remind you here's what I'm supposed to do? That's what we do. That's how we do the whole treatment approach. For everybody, it's I had a question, Dr. Lab. What's up? Um, a lot of us are having trouble getting uh, clients just because the client list is super short. Um, in the past, having put something out on Reddit for clients, is that something you can do again? Yeah, anybody can you know, put that out. I'm happy to do that. I talk to the co directors about how to do that. That's what the media stuff out there gets to more patients. Awesome. That would be. Really appreciate it. We're all just kind of on the start of this right now with getting people who want services. Yeah, we can do that. Try to get more folks. All right, we can go around um, giving parents really terrible advice. And then when that goes bad, I can then say, but if it doesn't work, call us here. Do that too. Thank you so much. Go find your own clients like a Walmart. <laughs> Sorry, you look like you could probably do better. Excuse <laughs> me, is your life not what you'd like it to be? Have you considered coming to therapy? What were the good news? That's right. What were the good news about CBT? Very CBT E for evangelizing. Other questions or thoughts about? Do you just know a lot of people who are going to think it's me first? Have good connections? I know a lot of people, but I also now have a lot of stuff. And I have a lot. So, uh, I, I, have, your snakes dogs. Yeah, I mean, I've got a snake in my office. I can put out the pond to get frogs, barn to get spiders, or poop. There's poop everywhere in the market. So. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's part of being an expert therapist. It's like, okay, well, where can we just do it? How can I? So certainly creativity. Yeah, also knowing, like, okay, well, how can I get to a very tall building? Right? Like, how can we get on top of it? Where would that? Yeah. What bathroom is going to be really gross that we can go to? <laughs> Um, oh, too many. Uh, <laughs> Which ones are going to be less bad? Okay, sorry, we're going to use the faculty bathrooms on the second floor for this purpose. The thoughts question. Yeah, here. 
see you next week. Uh, we would like to crack the over email from each other. Can I get those two yes. questions? Yep. I'm like, oh, I'm going to be doing it. Yeah, but. Uh,